what would a Greek hear when they heard the name Eve, which in Hebrew is Chava, right? Uh, but when you when you put it as Eva, or Western Mediterranean languages, it becomes Eva, which sounded to the Greeks like Evas, and Eva was something that you would shout in a procession of Dionysus. You know that Yahweh is a bad dude because he delights in blood. Any god who's bloodthirsty uh, is, is probably not really God, but probably a, probably a demon in, in disguise. So Cain realizes this, and this explains why Yahweh is not at all happy with Cain's sacrifice of fruits, but why he's very happy with the bloody blood of bulls and goats. I'm with the great sage once again, Dr. M. David Litwa. And uh, yeah, we're, we're going to talk about the Cainites. And are they even real? Do they exist? And but before we even get into this, this is a juicy subject. You guys are going to love this. This will be a two-part series like the last one. We're going to get into all the, the, the uh, overview, who they are, if they exist or not. But then we're going to go a little bit deeper. And if you want to get initiated into the, the deeper, greater mysteries, you'll have to follow the Patreon. M. David Litwa's Patreon. Here's, I'm showing it on the screen right now. The link is in the description, guys. Click on that link. And then if you like what you hear in this video, follow to the next video that's on the Patreon. So how are you doing today? Excellent. Good to see you, Neil. I'm a little bit under the weather, but I'll, I'll push through. Uh, apologize for the voice. I'm yeah. glad you called me the great sage because I think others called me the great Satan, but I appreciate <laughs> your, uh, I appreciate all your uh, advertising for me and uh, the plugs. Um, this is a really fascinating topic here, and this comes out of my book, Found Christianities, where I look at all the varieties of Christianity that basically uh, others said weren't Christianity. Um, and one of these varieties is the Cainites, named, of course, after Cain. Um, and Cain, as many of you know, is in Genesis 4. He was cursed by Yahweh, the creator. And it's always confused people through the centuries why that happened. Well, first of all, why God would curse anybody is a great question. But why curse Cain and why was the sacrifice of Cain's brother Abel acceptable, but not the sacrifice of Cain? Now, I'm not going to answer that question here. What I'm going to talk about is whether there was actually a group who viewed Cain as a hero for their own understanding of Christianity. Now, I'm going against what I think is the mainline scholarly position here, which uh, is well articulated by Berger Pearson, who said that there was never any such thing as a particular Cainite sect of Gnostics. There were instead varieties of Gnostic heretics who could from time to time be labeled gen generically as Cainites according to a well-established topos in early Judaism and Christianity. The Cainite system of Gnosis delineated as such by the heresiologists is nothing but a figment of their imagination." Unquote. Now I apologize for the scholarese here a bit. Um, there are some things that Berger Pearson would say in 1990, which I would never say in 2022. I don't call anybody a heretic. That's not really uh, a helpful term historically uh, and theologically. Um, but basically, Pearson's position is that the heresiologists made up the Cainites, that is, those who honored Cain and saw him as a model for their faith. And that's all. And it's just a figment of their imagination that they pulled together from various other so-called Gnostic ideas and traits. And today I want to show you that this position is probably, if not certainly, wrong. But let's start with the evidence. One of the things that you look for when understanding whether there's a, a group or maybe just a set of ideas is to see how many people independently refer to either 
a group or a set of ideas. And it turns out that there is multiple, and I would consider partially independent attestation of a group of canines that is not just a set of ideas, but a set of persons. Uh, and looking at Clement of Alexandria first in his book, The Stromata, written around 200, he says some heresies, again, that's his term, are named from their main views and from what they worshipped like those of the Kenites and Alphites. We have Tertullian in his prescription against heresies, quote, there are even now another sort of Nicolaitans. Theirs is called the Cain heresy, unquote. In the refutation of all heresies, my absolute favorite heresy catalog, uh, Anonymous, we have, quote, other heresies are named, such as those of the Cainites, Ophites, Noachites, and others of the same ilk, unquote. And in Origins Against Celsus, Origin at one point says, quote, I think that Celsus probably got wind of the so-called so Ophites and Cainites, unquote. So we see here uh, four different sources that attest a Christian group called the Cainites. Clement is in Alexandria, Tertullian is in North Africa, the refutator is in Rome, and Origen was in Alexandria and Palestine. And although they might not be entirely independent, I think that probably Tertullian and the refutator are independent. Uh, Origen may be dependent on Clement, but uh, actually we don't really know. So there you go. They thought that there was a group. Let's look at our main witness, though, for the so-called Canaanites, and that is actually Irenaeus, who is writing any time between 180 and 189 in his book called, now called anyway, Against Heresies, but originally called The Refutation and Overthrow of Gnosis, falsely so-called. And this is the very, very last chapter of book one. And in the version of this talk for the Patreon, I'm going to go line by line through this passage. But for the purposes of just introducing this material, I'm just going to give you a set of bullet points. From Irenaeus, we learn that there are a set of Christians who honor Cain, Korah, who's also in the Hebrew Bible, and the Sodomites. Uh, and all of these people were opponents of the creator deity, Yahweh. Now, Irenaeus definitely does not mention the term Cainites, okay? So just keep that in mind. These people, or this set of Christians, affirmed wisdom as a protecting goddess. So just like Valentinians and Sethians, they believe in wisdom. Uh, they also seem to have prohibited sex, and uh, they referred to the creator as womb, and they believed that they had to destroy the works of the womb, which means that they had to oppose the creator who commanded in Genesis, be fruitful and multiply. That was a bad command, and you should directly disobey that command, according to this group. They also said that one must, just as Carpocrates taught, go through all things. Now, it's never made clear what going through all things is, but if you read my book on Carpocrates, I give you very thorough discussion of what I think this means. You don't have to believe Irenaeus. Uh, and finally, this group had a distinctive ritual in which acts performed are attributed to angels who preside over those acts. So this is what we can gather from Irenaeus. And the final point, which I'll come back to, is that according to Irenaeus, these people used the Gospel of Judas. Now, this is important. They didn't compose the Gospel of Judas, but they used and they liked the Gospel of Judas because they understood this Gospel to say that Cain was a hero. Now, it turns out that when we finally discovered the Gospel of Judas, it's a much more ambiguous portrait of Judas, but that doesn't mean that 
these people were necessarily uh, not using the Gospel of Judas. It's just they had a particular interpretation of it. Now, our next chronological heresy catalog comes from a text that's now today referred to as Pseudo-Tertullian. And Pseudo-Tertullian, in addition to Epiphanius and Philaster, make up a, we're all dependent, we think, on a single other heresy catalog called the Syntagma Against 32 Heresies. And this was early third century, and this has been lost. But if you read these three guys, Pseudo Tertullian, Epiphanius, and Philaster, you can get access to what that lost heresy catalog said. And this is what it said it explicitly refers to Cainites as a group. Okay, so all that ambiguity goes away that we saw in Irenaeus. They, this group is said to clearly distinguish between a mighty power and a weaker power, and the weaker power is the creator, Yahweh. Cain is said to be born from Eve and the mighty power, whereas Abel was born from Eve and the weaker power. And this difference explains how Cain overcame Abel. Then they had two conflicting theories about why Judas handed over or betrayed Jesus. In the first theory, Judas handed over Jesus because Jesus was subverting the truth. Now, this theory actually has many, uh, has a long reception history I won't get into. But in the second theory, Judas handed over Jesus because the crucifixion of Jesus was necessary to destroy the Creator, and the Creator was hindering this from happening, so Judas betrayed Jesus and set the machinery of salvation in motion. So that's why Judas is a hero, because without him, nobody would ever be saved. So we ought to be thankful to Judas for that. Now, just briefly, Epiphanius, who's writing in the late fourth century, says that a couple things that are unique. He says that they had a book in which an angel blinded Moses and that they also used a book called The Ascent of Paul, which explained the things unutterable in the third heaven. Wow. Now, we don't have The Ascent of Paul, I wish we did. nor do we have a book in which an angel blinds Moses. To my knowledge, I, I don't actually know, but as far as I know, we don't have any of these books. But this is a witness to distinct usage of books by Cainites. So if we bring all of this material together, and I'm just giving you a summary of it, okay? On the Patreon, I'll be giving a much lengthier description of these texts. I would like to conclude or hypothesize, I should say, this, that there was actually in the second century a group of Christians who honored Cain, Korah, and the Sodomites, as well as Judas. And the reason I think that is as follows. First of all, it's not just that they had a set of ideas that were pulled from a variety of other Christian sects, that is, Valentinians or Sethians or whatnot. They actually had concrete practices. They read concrete books, like the Ascent of Paul. They had a practice, ritual practice, in which they invoked angels, okay, and they had a practice of refusing sexual intercourse and reproduction. Well, at least they refused reproduction. I'm not actually entirely sure if they refused sex. I should be more clear there. They used actual and in part surviving literature like the Gospel of Judas, but I'll emphasize that they didn't compose this gospel, okay? If they did compose the gospel, Judas really would be an unambiguous hero, but he's not. But they definitely used it, and that comes directly from Irenaeus. And we have the gospel of Judas, so we know that there was interest in, if not redeeming Judas, portraying a different portrait of him. So there must have been some people who really cared about Judas, okay? They are multiply attested by a number of heresiologists, and the heresiologists, although they might in some cases be inaccurate, and in very rare cases they might try to mislead, and oftentimes through their language unconsciously mislead, 
I think overall, the heresiologists were trying by their own lights and in their own framework to be accurate. So they wouldn't just make up a group. And that's a conclusion that I've learned after many years of studying this material. There are cases where heresiologists will think of a certain, will get receive a text and written by a single individual, and then they will intuit that there's a group behind that individual or text. But they don't completely make up material. Now, this group who honored Cain, Korah, the Sodomites, and Judas may or may not have called themselves Cainites. We actually don't know. They may be early if they are already referred to in the Epistle of Jude. And the Epistle of Jude is a really important work for everybody to check out because this is a text which we can date fairly early, between, I would say, 120 and 150, that polemicizes against those who follow the quote-unquote way of Cain and who received the judgment of Korah. So we know that some Christians were really interested in these dudes. Now, I'm not going to go any further here. I will go much further in the Patreon, but I'll send you some further reading that quote from Berger Pearson is from uh, an article called Cain and the Cainites. April DeConnick, who follows Pearson, uh, has an article in a recent uh, volume. And uh, even about the same time, I should say, Gary Tromph uh, has a nice discussion of this material and includes the Epistle of Jude and the Gospel of Judas. Um, all this material I would recommend for those of you wanting to get some of the real scholarly meat. But uh, for all of you, I would say, join the Patreon. I'm going to be discussing their theories and the uh, heresiological texts in detail so you can make your own decision. That's it for this introduction. Um, and I'll turn it over to Neil in case he has any thoughts or comments, questions. Um, and I hope all of you are able to leave comments and questions as well. Yeah, so I, I'm my question is going to be like sort of in our space, but just for for the sake of content, let's 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 see if you can let's see if you have an answer for it. Um, so I'm always wondering because I'm starting to learn Greek now. And I'm looking at the Septuagint, and it's just a whole nother world compared to the Hebrew Bible, I think. And I'm wondering, like, I'm not going to go full Russell Gamerka and think this is the first Bible. I don't, I don't think he's right about that. I don't know. If, are you aware of that or no? Vaguely, I know the old Russell's work. I uh, his his well, recent theories. Yeah, it's like, I'm not going there. I'm, what I'm saying is, but I think what happened when the Septuagint was created. As I think people started to understand the Greek Greek speaking people, like in Egypt and stuff, were interpreting this text through their Greco Hellenistic worldview. So they would read things differently, I think. And I want to get your thoughts on this because, for example, the 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 first sentence of Genesis is in the beginning, Theos get, creates Aronos and Gaia. He creates those that's that's the name of two gods, Aronos and Gaia heaven and earth and you almost got to wonder if they're the they're theologically interpreting these things in a weird way where they hear these words or re read these words and maybe they're thinking like i don't know maybe they're just seeing it differently than than the jews would in the hebrew but i say all this, i say all that for a reason because eve the, the, that word eve has a background iwas it's a bak is it it's a bakit cry now, I'm just. This is just me exploring. I never heard this from anybody else. I'm not getting this from a scholar or anything. This is just my craziness right now, and I want to get your thoughts. I'm wondering if these Cainites are sort of like looking at Cain as like, oh, he's a tiller of the ground. Like, okay, he was the, one of the good guys, or just like this. Just like they have uh, Yahweh as the as the demiurge. Maybe they're interpreting it this way, and that's how you get these type of flipping it on its head type of. Uh, theology. What do you think about that? Well, these are really good questions, Neil, and um, I'm glad you're learning Greek. It really does revolutionize everything. Um, 
and I'm offering a Greek course on my Patreon as well, um, or at least help for those who want to learn it. Um, in fact, you're not the first to point out the similarity between the name Eve and the Greek Evos. And Clement of Alexandria pointed out the very same thing in his book called the Protrepticus, or the Exhortation to the Greeks. And he said that it was Satan who designed that little parallel, uh, just like Justin Martyr, if you're familiar with that. <laughs> um, does, he, does, he, does he talk about the Kore thing? Because look at, have you not seen that word not next to Bacchanal where it says Kore? That's, that's the Persephone. Now, now, Persephone is the one who bites the pomegranate. Instead of getting kicked out of heaven, she's stuck in hell. Do you see the parallel, or is it just me? Because this is this is how, this is how my mind goes. I go, I see parallels <laughs> everywhere. I, sometimes I go too, I get too crazy with it. Well, yeah. So I would, I would encourage caution. We're here, and when we're talking about parallels, we're here at the level, still at the level of purely phonetic parallels. Um, sure. What would a Greek hear when they heard the name Eve, which in Hebrew is Chava? Right. Uh, but when you when you put it as Eva, um, when it comes into Mediterranean um, or Western Mediterranean languages, it becomes Eva, which sounded to the Greeks like Evas. And Eva was something that you would shout in a procession of Dionysus. It was, it was like like hi ho, sort of like that. Um, I, I mean, it was it was meant to like get you excited and and ramped ramped up. Um, and so that's, that's about, that's thinking like a Greek. Um, but in terms of its actual semantic content, um, I'm not sure it had a very thick semantic content. Um, but we can talk more about that. Um, yeah, so absolutely, uh, about Cain as tiller of the soil. Now I'll talk more about this in the Patreon, but okay. if you do a little reverse engineering, you know that Yahweh is a bad dude because he delights in blood. So yeah, he wants why... to sacrifice. He wants he wants Abel who's killing animals. So right. you're so he, the he wants... type of people. They want the tillers. They think those are the good guys. Exactly. Yeah, that's definitely in the background. So any god who's bloodthirsty uh, is is probably not really God, but probably a probably a demon in in disguise. So Cain realizes this. And this explains why Yahweh is not at all happy with Cain's sacrifice of fruits, but why he's very happy with the bloody blood of bulls and goats, uh, because he 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 feeds off that stuff, and uh, he's he's not really God, and so that's this is also why Cain is a hero and why why he's he's been called a murderer. But the, the true story of Cain is the story of the man, who, the first human being who realized that the creator was evil. And he was the first, but he was not the last. Right. And those who learn that secret are the ones who are redeemed. That's the gnosis. That's the gnosis. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so... If I'm not mistaken, there's a lot more we're going to talk about this. You're going to probably go, we're going to go deeper and uh, it gets a much bit, deeper. Yeah. yeah, it gets a lot crazier. I just wanted to touch the surface a little bit, but that iceberg down there, it's big. So, yep. guys, the link's in the description. If you want to get more on this, hit that link and um, there's some tiers. Check out which tier is best for you and uh, it will see you over there because I'll be over there. Thanks, everybody. Yep, leave questions and comments, and yep, join the community. And you have just attained true gnosis. You have just attained true gnosis. The Demiurge has no power over you. Jesus.